I've been humming that song all week and uh, thinking about that and uh, how we need to let our light shine all around the neighborhood, amen? How that we need to let our, shine, let our light shine wherever we go. You know, and the scripture says in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world, let your light shine before men. You know, and uh, so that's the challenge that I want to set before you. You know, Carolyn always tells me, she said, Gerald, when you preach, you always say you have a favorite story or you have a favorite scripture. Well, I do, and I have a lot of favorites. But I want to do the introduction to this message, and I, I want to share probably one of the, my, I guess, probably it, it ranks number one as, as a, one of my favorite stories. But how many of you have ever heard of the Jesus Film Project? The Jesus Film that, that, that's been all over the world. I think it's been translated in over a thousand different languages. And there is no tell, telling how many people have been saved because of the Jesus Film Project. I hadn't watched the Jesus Film for a while. And this week I sat down and, on YouTube and I watched the you know, bits and pieces of, uh, of the film. Well... I want to share the story because the man that, that was the founder of this project, uh, he was looking for a way to be able to, to get this film promoted and to be able to spread it around the world. And so he was able to receive an audience with some key people in Hollywood. The main man happened to be a Jew. And so he had the audience and he met with them and out of that, he received favor to be able to produce, mass produce this film and led to this film being translated into over a, a thousand different languages and to be able to be spread around the world with, like I said already, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people receiving Christ as their Savior. Well, the interesting thing, the story I like, this director that was a Jew after the meeting and everything went in a positive way that they were getting ready to help produce this film for this organization. This Jewish man asked the director over this, he said, could I have a private meeting with you? And this man had no idea. He knew he, this guy was a devout Jew, and he was asking for a private meeting. And so he said, we had our private meeting, and this man says, I need to talk to you uh, because I have some real questions in my life. He said, my wife and I have one child, and said, that child became very sick, and it looked like we were going to lose our child, but said, we hired a maid, and I was walking down the hallway, and the maid's door was open, and she was on her knees crying and weeping, and I thought, what's wrong with her? And so he said, I asked, said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I am praying for your child that Jesus Christ will heal your child and restore your child's health. And said, God did that. And said, I quizzed her. And she said, since I have become your maid, God spoke to my heart that I need to pray every day for you and your wife and your child that God would take care of you. And so he says, we didn't understand, but he said, I decided that every day I would have the maid come in and she would pray for us and said, she, before we would leave or we'd go anywhere, she'd have prayer over us. He said, as life went on, he said, my wife got a terminal disease. And he said, the maid began to cry out. And he said, my wife was in the hospital and it didn't look like she was going to live. The maid kept praying. And he said, I was so frustrated and so searching for some answers. And he said, I left the hospital and I walked towards the synagogue. And he said, when I got to the synagogue, they were so busy, they didn't have time to talk to me. So he said, I just wanted to walk. And he said, I started to walking and I came to this little storefront church. And he said, it felt like something just directed me in there. And he said, they were in there singing and praising and worshiping God. And he said, this young pastor come up to me and he said, sir, can I help you? And he said, me being a Jew, I didn't know what to expect. But he said, my heart was heavy. And I just told him, he said, my wife's dying. My world's coming to an end. I don't know what to do. And so he said, that young pastor tucked me by the hands and prayed for me that God would restore my wife. He said, I went on home. He said, the next morning I got up and I went to the hospital. He said, the doctor was waiting for me. And he said, I've known you. 
I thought you was a devout Jew. He said, I am a devout Jew. He said, then why was this young Protestant preacher sitting up all night praying and crying for God to heal your wife? And he did. Can you imagine that? Healed his wife and said, God restored my child. God is restored. But he said, the reason I need to talk to you, he said, my maids died and I don't have any connection. What am I going to do? And the founder of the Jesus Film Project said, I can help you. And he shared Christ with that Jew. And that Jew got on his knees and he asked Jesus Christ to come into his life. To be, isn't that a part? That's the story behind the Jesus film, guys. Can you imagine the little maid let her light shine? Jeopardize her position maybe because of them being devout Jews. But yet she was willing to say, I'm going to pray and I'm going to be bold enough to tell you what I'm doing. Can you imagine him being led to that little storefront church? And yet that pastor with unbelievable compassion, not even knowing them, went and stayed all night crying out to God that God would heal that lady, and God did. Isn't that powerful? And yet that was the beginning of this movie of uh, seeing thousands upon thousands of people being saved through that movie. Isn't that a powerful story? You know, in light of that, The challenge I believe we face in the year 2015 is to come to the decision that we have a responsibility to let our lights shine in Ava, Southern Illinois, wherever we live. Can I hear an amen out of that? Now, I got, actually, I'm going to give you back-to-back stories, okay? This has been my story week. Have you ever heard of the little man on George Street in Sydney, Australia? Joe's hand. Anybody else ever heard of the little, it's called the little man on George Street in Sydney, Australia, okay? I didn't realize it, but I found out, Joe, did, uh, uh, there's a book written about this man. I've always heard the little man on George Street. The guy's name was Frank Jenners, and Frank gave his heart to Jesus Christ, and he owned a little business on George Street in Sydney, Australia. And because God had touched his life so powerfully... He made a commitment that he would serve God, and every day of his life that he lived, he would tell 10 people this simple question. And they talked about the little man, said people would be walking down Jar Street, and this little gray-haired man would pop out of of nowhere, and he'd pop out of his business, and he'd say, excuse me, sir, may I ask you a question? And the question was, if you died today, do you know where you would go? And then he said, you have two choices. You can go to heaven or you, go, you can go to hell. And he'd pop off and he'd be gone. And so anyway, he did that ten times a day for the rest of his life. Well, the story, how it got started, this pastor was preaching in an evangelism conference. And he was talking about people accepting Christ, letting their light shine. And a guy stood up excited. He said, man, he said, you'll never believe how I got saved. And this pastor said, what do you mean? He said, I was in the Navy, and we was docked, and we were in Sydney, Australia, and we was just going down the street on Jar Street, and this little gray-haired man popped out and asked me, said, may I ask you a question? If you died today, do you know where, where you're going? He said, it set me back. It upset me at first. He said, I thought, how dare somebody challenge me with that question? But he said, I couldn't get it out of my heart. He said, I found the chaplain. I gave my heart to Jesus. Amen? And... This story goes on and on, and this pastor pastor was doing these evangelists, and every place he would go, he would share a little bit of that story, and somebody would jump up and say, I met that man on Jar Street. Now, here's the interesting thing. The reason, and it goes on, and, and they figure in Frank Jenner's life that he witnessed over to over a hundred thousand people sharing that question. But here's the sad part about it. Frank Jenner's died not knowing how many people accepted Christ off of that. And it is amazing because as this man traveled around the world, he kept sharing that story, and there were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people received Christ because of that little man popping out there asking that question. Isn't that pretty powerful? And, you know, I didn't know this, Joe, but in the book... This evangelist made his way back to Sydney, Australia, and met Frank Jenner's and told Frank Jenner's what had happened, and Frank Jenner's died right after that. Isn't that something? And he lived his whole life wondering what happened out of him being committed to popping out there and asking that question. 
And I thought, wow, what a powerful story. And yet, how to let his light shine. And, and, and in the articles, in the book written about Frank Jenner, he said, sickness or whatever, through the wars, he said, I was faithful to sharing that ten times a day. I thought, wow. Now, the challenge is, we need to let our lights shine. We need to make a decision in the year 2015. I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to share the love of Jesus. I'm going to share the, the grace of Jesus. I'm going to share what God has done in my life. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me quickly to Romans chapter 1. And I want to read verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and, and verse 16. And it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now I want you to think about that simple passage of Scripture that Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Christ. You see, we need to make a decision in the year 2015 to say, I'm not ashamed of this message. I need to make a stand and I need to boldly proclaim the message of the gospel of Christ. Amen? And, and that's what Paul says. He says, I, I'm not ashamed of it. The reason I'm not ashamed of it is it's the power of God. How many of you believe the power of God transforms lives? Amen? I, you know, Frank Jenner's, he was a sailor himself. And he had all kinds of problems. He said, I had all kinds of He said, I, 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 I was really messed up in life. He said, somebody shared Christ with me. I opened my heart up and I accepted Christ into my life. And he said, you know what? God set me free of all of those hangups. God set me free of the alcohol. God, he said, I, I, I was a, a gambler. He said, I done everything wrong. And he said, when I met Christ, he said, I experienced the power of God that transformed my life and set me apart. And he said, I've never been the same since. You see, I believe that that's the kind of gospel that you and I need to get so persuaded about that we're not ashamed of it, that we want to share it with everybody that we come in contact with. And, you know, I, I want you to think about it, you know, Here's one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. When you think about the power of salvation, it says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Now think about this. The same Spirit, Romans 8, 11, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Let me put my footnote in here. When you receive Him, when you receive Him, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives and dwells in you. Isn't that pretty powerful? Doesn't that stagger your mind to think that if I receive Christ into my life, that God places His Holy Spirit, the, the power of God in my life, that transforms my life? I mean, that sets you free, that breaks the chains of bondage, that literally begins to give you a new life, as Cliff Harrell's favorite scripture is, is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things, the power of God is, is broken, the, the, the old things in your life, the strongholds, the the, the things that handicap you and set you free and give you the ability to sing a new song about him. Amen? And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God, the power of God that transforms life to bring salvation. And here's what, I, I love this word salvation, okay? The word salvation simply means it. It means to save, which that makes sense, doesn't it? Salvation means to save, but it means to set free. It means to heal. It means to deliver. And so what Paul is saying, this message of salvation, it is the power of God that will set you free, that will bring salvation to your life, that will bring healing to your life, that will deliver you from all of the bondages of this world. And you know what? The simple message of that is, to those who believe. Well, how many realize we need to be persuaded of what we received? We need to be persuaded that it's for everybody. We need to pers be persuaded that we can share like Frank Jenner and God is going to do the rest. It's our responsibility to be the witness. It's God's responsibility to do the work. Is that not true? And she, so Paul says, I'm not going to be ashamed of this gospel. I'm going to share it and I'm going to preach it. I'm going to Pass it on that it will cause people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to turn to one more passage of Scripture. I love this passage of Scripture. I don't know how I didn't preach on this. I don't think I've ever preached on this passage of Scripture before, but it's in Matthew, uh, the ninth chapter. And I like this passage of Scripture. Nin ninth chapter. Matter of fact, Matthew 9 is just full of all kind of neat things. It's 
full of miracles and it's full of God touching people's lives. And uh, so listen to it. And starting in w- with verse 27, it says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men uh, came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that uh, I am able to do this? Pretty powerful question, isn't it? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be uh, to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one know it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him uh, in all of the country. I, I always thought that, uh, that, that when two or three different times in the New Testament, that passage, that, that when Jesus said, you know, don't share it, and they shared it everywhere because they was excited. Can you imagine if your eyes were blind and you, they were open? You know, that's what uh, Paul Winchester said when they, uh, down there in the aerobics when the lady had the, the knee that was all messed up and it was swelled up great big. And uh, uh, Paul said, you want us to pray for you? And, and she said, well, yeah, that'd be neat. And so Paul sa- said, well, sit over there and I'll pray for her. And she said, you mean now? <laughs> And he said, and here, and he said, yes, now and here, and just sat on that bench, and, and my wife and I will pray for you. And, and so she didn't, you know, she thought when he said, I'll pray for you, that, you know, he'll just think about me, you know, sometime and say a little prayer. Well, anyway, she sat on the bench, and when she sat on the bench, they got the oil out, and they uh, anointed that knee with oil, and they started to pray. They said it was just like you had stuck a pin in a balloon, and all of the swelling and everything went out, and it just went back to normal. And the lady started moving, and she jumped up and started dancing, and she didn't really care what anybody thought at that point. And she went running into the lady's dressing room hollering, you got to see this, you got to see this. And she run everybody out of there, and she told everybody. Okay, so now when you see that setting, and he's, their blind eyes are open, and he said, but don't go tell everybody. You know, they did this just the opposite. They went and told everybody, you know, and, and because of the excitement. But now here's the amazing thing that I think we are told to go into all the world and tell everybody. <laughs> and it's like prying eye teeth to get everybody to go someplace, to get the church to get full of life enough to say, I want to go tell somebody, get excited enough about what God's done in their life because, oh, we don't want to offend anybody and we don't want to be over, you know, uh, pushy about this thing. And we'll just sit back and let the Muslims win the world. Oops, that wasn't supposed to come out. We'll just let Islam just take over the world because we don't want to offend anybody. And, and, you know, it won't bother when they put us in prison and torture us because we kept our mouth shut. Oh, no, I'm not. Listen, guys, I'm going to tell you what. It matters because if somebody dies and goes to hell, you think it'll matter to them whether you, you know, you think about that, guys. Hmm? You know, I, we're talking about eternity here. And, you know, here's the thing I love about this passage of Scripture. Simple little thing. Two blind men heard about Jesus, and you know what? They followed him. They pursued him because they wanted something. They believed that he had something to offer. Amen? And so they followed him, and I I, I love this uh, thing. I pray that we can let our light so shine, that we can be so in love and so involved in our relationship with Jesus that people would want to follow in here. Amen? That people would want to experience what we've experienced. That the church would be so alive and, and, and full of life that people would want to come because they were searching for something real. You see, I want us to believe that in the year 2050. Uh, and, and listen to what happens when you follow. These two men received transforming power in their life. Is that not true? And you know, the scripture says, and I love this, and, uh, uh, when it talks about following him, Hebrews 7.25 says, when we come to him, he will, he's able to save to the uttermost. Can you imagine? When we come to him, when we really search out him, it says he's able to save to the uttermost. You know what that means? Entirely, completely, that he can set you free. Pretty good deal, isn't it? Well, that he can save to the uttermost. That he can touch you at your point of need. He can touch you in your difficulty of life. And he can save you to the uttermost. He can complete what he starts in you. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Pretty heavy. You know, one of my favorite passages is in Ephesians where it says he can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask, more than we can imagine, more than we think according to the power that works in us. Wow. 
How many of you believe that? Because the real question I want to leave with you this morning, the real question, the real challenge, when Jesus was dealing with these blind men, man, it was one thing to follow after him. It was one thing to pursue him. But man, they got in that room and he looked at them and he says, do you believe this? Do you believe I can do this? Do you really believe? Guess what? All of a sudden, it was in their ballpark. You know, man, they had a good response. They said, yes, Lord, we believe. And guess what? The transforming power, the miracle of God started to working within those men. Now, here, I want to leave this with you because the answer was they said to him, yes, Lord. Well, the question to you guys, do you believe the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to all men? Do you believe that God is able to meet all your needs according to his riches and glory? Do you believe that God is the one that you can cry out to, the God that you can pursue, the God that you can seek out, and he is able to touch your life at your point of need? You see, we need to make a decision that we believe that He is alive in the year 2015. We need to make a decision that God can take this little church and fill this little church to overflowing. We need to believe that in the year 2015 that God can take and raise up a bunch of Frank Jenners. Amen? That God can touch people. I, I was telling a, a guy that I talked to this week, and he was wanting to know, he says, what are you doing in your retirement? And I said, I'm so busy, I don't have time to think about what I'm doing. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I said, you know, it's kind of neat. I said, God opened up East St. Louis this year for the men. He said, what do you mean? And I said, they were riding and tearing up in Ferguson, and they were accepting Christ and praising God in East St. Louis. Isn't that pretty exciting? Do you realize that the men that on the Monday night prayer meeting that we're talking about, God laid on these men's heart to go to East St. Louis? And do you realize the trips that they made to East St. Louis, the city officials of East St. Louis were overwhelmed because white men from southern Illinois was going to East St. Louis. And so they invited them, and the fire department and the police department put on a big cookout in the park and invited everybody to come and had the men there sharing. Isn't that pretty neat? Isn't that pretty neat? And they're invited back this year to go in and work East St. Louis. I always think about it. When we were walking down the street carrying the old cross, and I seen the, the black lady across the street, and she was walking along, and, and I cut across the street, and I stopped her, and I shared with her a penny, and told her, I said, I just want you to know that God loves you, and so do I. And she stood there, and she looked at me, and I always remember her response, Dave. She said, in all of my life, I would never even imagine, or I would never even dream there, there is a white man standing down in, in the inner part of East St. Louis, and what I was doing while she was thinking that and telling that, I was putting my arm around her, hugging her. And she as though a white man would be hugging me out in the middle of this street, telling me that God sent him here to say that Jesus loves her. And we prayed together standing along that sidewalk and began to allow God to touch her life. Isn't that pretty neat, guys? You know, and, and, and she said, in my wildest dream, I never dreamed that that would ever happen. And matter of fact, I, I'll tell you one story and we'll pray. When the guys went up, they took a bus up to East St. Louis when they had the thing in the park. Wasn't it a bus? Was you in that group, Dave? You went with me, didn't you? Okay. But they took a bus, and they didn't know exactly where the park was at. And so, anyway, this little guy, sim similar to George Jenner's, popped up, and he said, can I help you guys? And he said, well, we're invited. They're having a big thing at the park, and we're lost. The guy said, just follow me. And that guy become their tour guide took them through all the places they needed to be, stayed with them all that day, let them out, and then left them. Now, if that's not God's blessing, guys, saying that he makes divine appointments, amen? And so let's stand together this morning, and here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Do you believe that Jesus Christ can work in your life in the year 2015? Do you believe that he can touch your life and enable you and equip you to be the representative that he de so, so desires for you to be. To so touch your life that you fall in love with him more than you've ever been before. Well, Carolyn's not in here. And I wanted her to be able to give the word that God gave her Wednesday night. Because while the Okies were here, 
God gave her a word, and and, and I I want her to do that. I I don't want to really spoil you. You have to wait. See, I'll give you an anticipation of what God spoke to her, and uh, uh, she shared it with me on the way home, and how that God began to stir her heart about this church. So that of this whet your appetites, okay? Make you want to come back, but you allow God to softly speak to your heart. I believe He's more than enough to meet every need we have. He's more than enough to help you be a success in the year 2015. Those two blind men said, yes, Lord, we believe. Yes, Lord, we believe. I want you to leave here. You know, doesn't that kind of, yes, Lord, 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 yes, Lord. Wow. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you're able. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, you can do it. Yes, Lord, you can open doors. Yes, Lord, you can make divine appointments. Yes, Lord, you're a God that makes a way where there seems to be no way. Doesn't that excite you? What well, does it mean? Well, let's pray it again. And as God speaks to your heart, leave here saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I, I've seen that, that, Father, as water is to the desert, that causes life and causes it to bloom. May your word be to our souls. May your word be to our lives like a refreshing like a fresh drink, reviving faith within us and excitement and expectation. Oh, Father, speak to each one of our hearts. And may we go through this next week and through this year saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Wow, yes, Lord, you're more than enough. Thank you, Father God. Meet every need here. Touch every life. Work with your grace and your power and your loving kindness. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hug somebody around you. Tell them you love them in Jesus. 